Welcome to Conversations. My guest today is Sharon Reynolds. Sharon is a dear friend. Um, welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you, Greg. This, mm. this is a fun opportunity. Yes. Um, my first question for you today is, if you had to give up the horses or give up the kids, which would it be? It would be a hard decision. <laughs> That's what I it thought. It would be a hard decision. This is springtime, and in springtime, one's thoughts drift in to thoughts of which stallion to use to raise the world champion horse that you dream of. And you go through all of these uh, stallion books and read over breeding uh, records and call your friends and compare notes. and. Sharon and I are in a group, and I'm always trying to rein her in, so to speak, you know, because she wants to talk about horses or her grandkids. How are the grandkids? Fine. As you know, there are three of them that are living with us, and I'm not committed yet. I, they've made a call to Warm Springs to be on the lookout, <laughs> but other than that, I mean, we're dealing really very nicely. Well, that's good. It's nice to bond with the children at that age. and. Uh, feel like you have a part of their life and maybe even a responsibility to shaping things for them. That's great. Sharon, I met you the day that we had the first gay town meeting. A uh, friend came up, said, I want you to meet this lady, and uh, told you that we were doing the gay town meeting. You said you had a gay daughter, I believe, and you said, can straight people come? And I said, well, sure. And, so there you were in the front row of the gay town meeting asking questions and offering advice and uh, I've been stuck with you ever since. I know. You probably <laughs> never get rid of me. What is it, the Chinese custom that, um, well you didn't exactly save my life but you're probably no, well, responsible for me for a long time anyway. Let's talk about that gay daughter of yours. Her name is Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, I met her at Thanksgiving. You invited me down. We had dinner together. Um, you and she have been sort of out together for quite some time. Very comfortably out, All right. Greg. It's, uh, it's difficult at the beginning, but it is so important, I think, to be out. It's just uh, such a, more possibilities to life. If there's a chance that you're afraid that someone will find out things like this or how they will react, it affects your relationship it's and uh, your ability to form relationships. You dodge intimacy because you're afraid you might drop some crumb of information. So it's just really worked out very well and very comfortably um, to be out, completely out. I remember you telling me once that she didn't want you to talk too much about it, and so you felt kind of a burden at first. That was, I would say, probably the first year after she was out, because you know, her rule was you don't out other people, that it was her responsibility and privilege to tell people in her own way and in her own time. And I think that that's, for the most part, true. But sometimes you get put in positions where you really don't have a lot, a lot of choice when somebody point blank asks you, I don't do well at evading. Yeah, I know. But yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Your mother is still living. Yes. Bless you, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. You told me uh, about some of, well, not troubles, but that she really helped a lot. My mother and father knew before we ever told them. They said, yes, we already know. Hmm. And um, my, my parents have always been very supportive as my older brother, my oldest brother, Dean, and um, they have celebrated Sarah's diversity and uh, gone more than tolerance, have uh, informed themselves, and on occasion my mother has done battle. For 86, I think that's pretty good. She could tell somebody that put them in their place yet. <laughs> well, how long have you lived in the valley? Oh, um, in, Re in Re Valley County, we've lived there about 16, 17 years. We lived for 17 years in Missoula prior to that. 
So you're an old timer. Yes, fifth generation Montana. Uh -huh. I was born and raised in the big hole. So your coming out with your daughter was to be taken seriously, but mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, it yeah. was she went to school here and you knew yes. people and she was instrumental there were all in, these in um, <clears throat> oh, reviving, revitalizing Lambda when she was here. They were very out and very progressive for the times, and um, her name was in the paper and. She received threats. We had our share of unsigned letters that came in the mail, things like that. But for the most part, our friends, if they couldn't understand, um, at least accepted. I have found this, this to be true. Um, I haven't found it a contentious thing at all. I think the most fun thing that ever happened to me was I was on a, my way to Bend, Oregon and stopped at a little Berg truck stop and I had my P flag pin on or mm -hmm. on my lapel and um, great big burly truck driver I was paying the bill etc looks at me and says like your pin lady <laughs> <laughs> and I thought boy never in my life would I have thought that I would have you know found an accepting person like that in in oh truck stop shall we say you know, when I started, well, I started outspoken and started a lot of things. And one of the things that just totally amazed me was how many straight people there are out there who are supportive, who lots of them. I went to a meeting uh, organizing the last parade that was here. And I assumed everybody that was there was gay. And I found out later that uh, John Garrity, good friend of mine, and Susan Vasilchuk, we're not gay at all. They just were there because they thought it was the right place to be and because they were supportive. You're another person who has uh, really been tremendous. We were talking a little bit earlier about the church. Uh, 83, I believe, the church decided it was going to be open and affirming. And you said that that was one of the reasons that you got involved with that particular church. Yes. I, had, um, I have always enjoyed being ch churched if you don't mind that, that um, label. And uh, I found after Sarah came out, she had been very active in the church where we belonged before. And uh, it was very popular. They had wanted us to send her on a mission and all that. And I thought that was a bit presumptuous for a, you know, a teenage child. And she really needed to um, be more mature to be effective. Well, anyway, when she came out in her freshman year of college, why um, all of a sudden there were different reactions from members of the, of the congregation. It was a little sad because she had been their appointed darling for, you know, a period of about four years. And then all of a sudden, without having changed anything, there were people that were thinking about, uh, you know, rethinking their relationship with her, etc. So I had had a talk with the pastor, and I cried and decided that I didn't like what he had to say. That it, this was not a situation that I felt comfortable with. If my child was not accepted for the good and worthy person that she was, then I didn't want to support that particular church. So I um, ceased to go. And out of the blue one day, I think God has a way of, of answering prayers. And this was pretty dramatic. Just out of the blue, Claudia Brown called me, voice out of the past, a girl I'd gone to college with, and said, would I like, would I like to be on a panel for a, a seminar they were having at the church, James Nelson. And I said yes, and she invited Sarah too, and we went. And I found these people that I um, associated with that weekend to be such deep thinking, just people. I was very impressed with their warmth and their their ability to to seek truth and to um, change their their mind to to progress. So um, I continued on, got on the committee for the open and affirming, and was there for that 
the year that culminated in the... I was so thrilled. I think that's one of the most thrilling times of my life was when that vote came down. And I know there were some people that were not yet really, really comfortable with the idea. They didn't really know what it meant, for instance. Mm -hmm. But um, since ours is a covenant church, they stood aside if they had doubts for those that had made up their mind and were sure and said, I accept this on faith. And through the years, it has worked out very well. You know, I think it's amazing. We, the reason this happened, well, you're the guest. You, how did this happen in the first place? Why did it come up as an issue? Um, because they, they had called a lesbian um, minister. Mm -hmm. And um, then when they went for approval, by there were those that had some deep, uh, deep reservations about it. And they found the church split on this. They did not continue. They, they reneged on their, their call. And afterwards, there was a lot of guilt and a lot of soul searching. And this precipitated a period of time where people um, educated themselves on the subject and examined their feelings and their fears and I think it made a stronger congregation for that had reading groups and it wasn't mm -hmm. uh, something that was lightly done it took no, them quite a while a great deal of effort a lot of study sessions reading discussing um, the whole bit and it culminated with that I believe the the high point of the educational experience was the James Nelson he is um, uh, some of the women, well, I, I know Fern Hart was instrumental in writing a grant to underwrite his coming here. He's wonderful. I've, I've got oh. the tapes of... He, Have you read his books? I haven't read, yes, I did. I take that back. I did read one of his books. Mm -hmm. Between Two Gardens. He's a... Uh, oh, yeah. Three of his books. He, really very good. He talks... Well, his point, and I have, you know, he has lots of points, but his big one is that the incarnation, if Jesus is coming into the flesh, and therefore he understands the flesh and understands all of our weaknesses and that we should do the same mm -hmm. for all of our I think that something that we need to do as modern day Christians or churched people I hesitate to just say Christians is to learn to appreciate their physical side as well as their spiritual side I don't think that they're that they're particularly separated I think that we can celebrate God with our bodies as well, and our senses as well as we do um, with our minds. I mean, when we're singing a beautiful song, that's prayer, isn't it? When we even, when we bring a homemade pie to a bizarre luncheon or something, that's a prayer, that's an offering. Um, but I really believe that he wants us there's a reason he gave us an earthly body, and that we shouldn't be ashamed of it, that we shouldn't um, loathe it, and that we should care for it and um, enjoy it. The reason I wanted you to tell that story about the uh, lesbian minister that they turned down is because April 1st, we have an event at the church, which is? My dear friend, D. Lundberg will become ordained and I so admire her grit and determination she came from a background that did not prepare her for gracious living let's put it that way she had to overcome rather a hard childhood and adolescence she overcame alcoholism put herself through college and was paying off her debts working as a counselor and felt the call to the church. She had not been raised in the church. She came to this as an adult and uh, just pretty much just stepped off the cliff. Uh, it was a leap of faith, truly, because she had no money and put herself through four years of divinity school. And she's going to be ordained. And she is uh, serving April the church first, mm -hmm. and the church that she she was accepted at a church in Iowa or Iowa City, Iowa <coughs> has been serving there since last summer. 
but has chosen to be ordained in this church because this is where her heart is. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. And we're just really, really proud. And anyone that would like to come and see this event, it's a, it's a, a real celebration in the life of a church to have an ordination in the first place. But I feel it's particularly special that we are ordaining our lesbian mm -hmm. daughter. Oh, that's great. You're involved in other things as well. Um, what are some of those? Well, you and I are on GAST, GAN yes. Straight Together. Uh -huh. You were one that, well, we were both mm -hmm. there at the very beginning of that. Mm -hmm. um, League of Women Voters. And, um, I really appreciate their uh, educating the public on the yes. issues and on candidates. The way, and I like the way they um, structure their meet, their um, organization. It's very fair and bipartisan. Uh, worth people's time. Um, I belong to um, the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center, and uh, uh, oh, I think you know, uh, have lots of interests, um, lots of things in the church, but. Do I dare mention worms? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'll be happy. Okay. No, no. I'll Go be ahead. Happy. Worm. Okay. You're raising worms now. Well, I am. I've been composting with worms for uh -huh. about oh, a year, year and a half, something like that. But uh, I'm getting more and more interested in this as a commercial venture. Uh huh. I think that. Um, well, I also belong to Mac Can and Caring for Creation, which. Those are the kinds of things we're studying, how we can learn to live harmoniously with nature, not just be ecologists and not just be industrialists, but find a way where we can give people jobs, but yet we can continue to live on this planet without uh, killing each other and all of the flora and fauna, etc. And I think there's a great future with the worms. Yes. Okay. Yes. So a, I think you are the wag that said to me one day, gas me, well, Sharon, what kind of poop are we going to talk about today? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Well, I guess worm manure is uh, very it's expensive, excellent. among it, other yes, things. It is a very, if you look in your gardening magazines, for a little box of uh, dried and powdered uh, worm castings, I would say a pound, you will pay $10 at least. If you'd want to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You come and look at my violets and you will want to. Your African Just, violets? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Just sprinkle a little, little on the top of your plant and water it for a month and you would be amazed at what you, what you can do. But I think someday you're going to find schools with their high-tech uh, composter in the school where the kids will learn to separate their garbage into what can be composted and what cannot. And they will put in with the worms. They will also have, they will not have to pay for garbage removal, number one. Number two, they will have byproducts which they can either sell or use on their lawns. I think it's a, it's a great idea. How many horses do you have now? Four and a half. Four and a half. We're, we're going to have a blessed event in the first week of May. And how's Marvin, your husband? Well, he's not quite as enthused about all these things as I am, but he takes it on faith. I guess we have a covenant <laughs> marriage. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, we had a party. Gast is a group that tries to promote just understanding between gays and straights, and we had a dessert buffet, or whatever you would call it. Mm -hmm. And you wow. brought a lot of people down from the valley there. Um, Want to tell? Uh, I was really intrigued by the couple who their second marriages, they both had gay daughters. You want to tell me just oh, a bit about them? Yes, yes. Um, I had met them way back, um, well, they, and they actually live in Missoula. Hmm. And um, they had tried PFLAG a little bit. There have been several times when we've, we've tried, uh, but each PFLAG chapter has to respond to the needs of its people. and. Um, 
you know, some people say, I want a very militant group. I want to go out there and I march, and somebody else says, no, I don't want to be visible. I want to sit and think, and I want to read and learn, and I want to talk to people and, and make some friends and be very quiet about things. And um, then there are so people like you. Huh? Yeah, nice, quiet people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's never. But we were talking about the. the they. Uh, yeah. Both had gay daughters from, mm -hmm. and when they got together for their second marriages, mm -hmm. and so they have. I find that my <coughs> next door neighbor has a gay. Hmm. Uh, if, if you are open, you find a great many people that have a member of their family. You know, if we go on this ten percent rule, which I really, really believe, why? Um, I had a, a dear cousin that I grew up with and was very fond of, and. Um, he died of AIDS. We were all very fond of him. And uh, I think there are other members of my family, you know, that are. Maybe they're not as out as, as Dan was, but, um, so they're in every family. I think they tend to run in families too, but, um, um, I really treasure my, my gay relatives and my gay friends. I want to ask you if you... How much does the church, your religion, inform these other things that you do? This is kind of a strange question, but I... No, I think I understand what you say, and especially um, having been in Gast, because we were all surprised to find, that even though we were from different religions, that this was a driving force in our life. And I think that it um, influences almost everything I do. I'm sometimes surprised how much it does. You know, I, when I, I will find myself interested in something and all of a sudden I'll think, yeah, there's a reason for that and it all kind of ties in to a central philosophy. I think it has something to do with caring. You know, Peter, I had him on the show and he talked about mm -hmm. the fact that uh, he got to the ministry from uh, the peace movement anti-Vietnam mm -hmm. and this, mm -hmm. it was social issues that brought him into the church mm -hmm. and once you start thinking about meaning and start caring about other people they kind of go together right you you find yourself caring for your world and um, I, I have yet really to see clearly why I did it but I uh, went to China for the women's um, uh, or uh, what would you call it the um, United Nations yeah. Women's Conference. Mm -hmm. The one that I went for the Mrs. NGO, Clinton went to, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, the, hers was the official one. You had to be a delegate to that. You had to be somebody very important, like an ambassador or a, oh. and that type of thing. But uh, went to the non-governmental one, where really the business was taken care of. There was a lot of influence there, a lot of networking, and it was a particular thrill. I think one of the the biggest things that happened to me was I held hands with a Pakistani grandmother. Now this might not sound very important, but when I'm reading the news and we're philosophically at odds in the Far East or the Middle East about things, and I'm wondering why the Muslims are doing what they do, it meant a great deal to my understanding of the world to touch another woman who had children, who had grandchildren, and she just wanted the very best for them. It was a very spiritual moment. The sights and sounds of all these women's bodies and voices was thrilling. It's an experience that uh, I, there's just none, none like it. it. It really broadened my, my outlook. I'll never listen to the news again the same way. There will be people, they will be individuals. And I like to keep that focus because it's easy to become frightened of people as a group or as a stereotype. And it's something that I battle, and I think everybody does. Mm. Uh, not fearing, not, uh, not hating because you fear. Well, I find this emphasis that you've got to remember that the emphasis is on individuals. When you start thinking about groups, if you start thinking about gay and straight and Indian and white and black and red, all of a sudden your, shit, your thinking shifts. 
if you can think about people as individuals mm -hmm. and try to work to help mm -hmm. individuals, and then you can get something done. As women, you know, their philosophy on things, they're the ones that bear and care for the children. This is a unique and special and wonderful uh, privilege that we have been giving, given. And it's the same everywhere. It was nice to know when I was in Japan and China that all women did wash. All women, you know, uh, have to take care of their little children. They have to prepare meals, however you do it. And uh, there's, uh, it draws you closer. Let's open another can of worms, yeah. sort of <laughs> worms. Um, you are, in some ways, just the typical housewife supporting your yeah, husband, so cooking nice. for the kids, the grandkids, having people over. Uh, and yet, you're so outspoken. Marv hardly says a word in public or has a chance to. Uh, you're, <laughs> or anyone else within a, a six you know, foot radius. Um, you're informed, you're intelligent. Uh, you're about as feminist, I guess, as anyone. Uh, how do you balance those things? Do you manage to? You know, it's funny because, um, well, I, I haven't always been a stay-at-home mom either. Uh, for over 20 years, I was uh, a teacher, and for the majority of that time, a special education teacher, and thoroughly enjoyed that facet of my life, too. Um, was teaching preschool, had a little fellow that didn't quite fit the mold, felt I didn't have the skills to serve him as well as I should have, traipsed over to the university and said, I have a weird, had a weird kid and I didn't know what to do with him. And they said, down the hall, special education. And so that was my love for a good many years. But um, I guess what I see is um, with my daughters as they grow older, as much as when uh, I've been called um, boring and repressive <laughs> no. by a teenager. Yes, oh, yes. Wow. And I, I told my, my oldest daughter, who was the author of that statement the other day, <laughs> that I can hardly wait until your kids are old enough to tell you you're boring and repressive. <laughs> and, um, they were all good children, and I'm very proud of them. They may not be going to be president of the United States or CEO of a company, and they aren't going to be wealthy, but they're honest. They're, um, they've never cheated anyone. They're straightforward. They take care of their responsibilities. And I think they care about others. And I think that that's the best that you could hope for you with your children. But um, I don't know if I've answered your question or just talked around it. Hmm, you kind of talked around it. But, yeah. uh, but I think that every woman should be uh, um, informed, uh, an informed voter. I think it's very important that women vote. And I think it's very important that they keep aware of this, the, the social issues as much as their time will permit. I know there's a period of time in your life where you're pretty much inundated with little kids and diapers and, and that sort of thing, or even getting a career started. I think it's nice for women to have that opportunity where they can uh, be mothers if they wish and stay-at-home wives, or they can be career women if that's what satisfies them. I, 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 the freedom to choose is, is very important to me. For everybody. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Sharon, it's a delight always to be with you and talk to you, and I'm so glad you came today. And let's go, let's go rummage sailing again. Uh, <laughs> I went with this lady, and she bought all this stuff for her grandkids, and uh, a wedding dress. Yeah, uh, we got up to the lovely, counter, lovely. and she said to the sales girl, "It's for him." <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. And I got very red. And <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank and you. Uh, I, the show goes on. I really want you to come back. Great. Thank okay? you.